So hello everyone, I'm Elena Vorobieva and I will present you a design method to improve the detection of uh, anomalies by uh, met ensemble methods. So the context is uh, the context of inspection, visual inspection of uh, industrial parts where images cannot be proceeded directly but have to be divided into patches. To improve the results and to have more robust results, uh, it is known to use ensemble methods. Among all possible ensemble methods, I will focus on uh, one particular, which is uh, to train one neural network and uh, to average the result of the end best epochs. But how to decide what is a best epoch? This is what this work is about. So in the state of the art, the, to measure the quality of an epoch, uh, people use um, measures, low scores, local to patches. For example, the loss of the, tri of the neural network. But in our context, in our industrial context, we want to retrieve the anomalies at least approximately uh, in the whole image. So um, individual results on the patches is not very pertinent. Moreover, we want to have a few false alarms, whatever its size. So methods which will measure local results on the patches are not pertinent for, what? for that. So I propose to have a new score to answer this industrial problem. For that, I add some steps during the validation phase of uh, the calibration of the training of the neural network. Uh, there are three steps. First, I reconstruct the global results of the whole image uh, by measuring results of the uh, individual results of the, on the validation patches. Uh, secondly, I, uh, <laughs> I trust how densely the, the results and, to, and compare it to the ground truth to create some curves of anomaly detection rate. <laughs> and thanks to those curves, I can compare the epochs by, having, by calculating the area under the curve. So this is my new score. So please visit my poster. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Thomas Cordier and I'll be presenting test adaptation with principal component analysis. This is a joint work with Victor Bouvier of Data IQ, Gilles Enaf of Telesla Center Systems, and Céline Hudlot, director of the MIX uh, laboratory here in uh, Central Supélec. So our work is to uh, tackle corruptions, uh, so specific uh, uh, distribution gap uh, from uh, Real, uh, real application, uh, here uh, brightness, contrast, and so on. But we want to do that uh, because it uh, altered the prediction uh, performance of a model. Uh, but we also want to do that in a fully test adaptation manner, so without changing the training scheme, so uh, corruption agnostic, and without any source data for deployability reasons. To do so, we only need a neural network with a PCA fitted on the training activations of the first convolutional layer, which give us the, the good properties of having a basis in which we can filter out the um, um, corrupted representation of a neural network with new parameters that we define here in a, a filter and that we compare with uh, singular values of the PCA. So uh, the parameters are optimized through uh, entropy minimization, and I will discuss with you uh, the technical part uh, in my, with my poster uh, uh, here. Uh, thank you. It's okay. Thank you, Tova.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Adrien Chantong from uh, Onera, and my poster is about um, data poisoning, which is a kind of uh, attack like uh, adversarial attack, but uh, which take place at training time and not at testing time. And precisely my poster is about um, what is the impact of what is done before training, because um, most of the time when we train uh, a deep network, for example, we take uh, ImageNet uh, weight and we fine tune from this weight and w I look uh, in, in this poster, what is the impact of the pre-training uh, of the network on the impact uh, of the poisoning? Well, this is uh, over for the English part, uh, but uh, if we come uh, see my poster, I will, uh, <laughs> I will speak more uh, in, in French. So you have one minute of questions. So good afternoon. I'm Timothy Fronto, and my poster is about evaluating uh, adversarial robustness on document image classification. This is a work I did at Credit Agricole's Data Lab. Um, so we're focusing here on visual classification models. It turns out that we can uh, generate uh, a perturbation for an original image that is in indistinguishable, that is imperceptible to human eye, and that will systematically be misclassified by a target model. This is what you, you see on the, on the upper side. So upper left, upper, upper right, you see an image that is cl rightly classified as a panda with 58% confidence. And the, and the upper left, you have the attacked one with a an imperceptible per perturbation and it's, and it's classified as a monkey. Uh, we can do the same on document images. And this is interesting, why? Because documents don't have the same inf semantic information. It has text, it has a layout, it sometimes has a logo. And we wanted to see um, how adversarial, atta uh, adversarial attacks can also affect this kind of um, classification models, uh, because we have a lot of um, frauds that we can imagine, imagine in sensitive use cases at Credit Agricole. So um, this is why we did this study that has not been yet on the specific task of document image classification. Uh, so in this first comprehensive benchmark, um, we use an open source data set, the RVL CDIP data set, which is the most common one for this kind of task. Um, we evaluate the robustness of two models in five different uh, defense configurations. We implement nine attacks in three different threat settings, and our ob objective is to uh, draw these curves you can see, and I won't spoil anything, but uh, some models are really not resilient to adversarial attacks. Other ones with better defenses are a lot more resilient. So if you want to know more about it, come see my poster. Thank you. So do we have Etienne here? Yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry? It was much faster than I expected. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, few short learning, which is the subfield of uh, machine learning focused on uh, learning from a few examples. So here you have a task of few short learning, uh, which is uh, taking this picture here and deciding whether it's uh, eggnog, dragonfly, a hammerhead, a vase, or a valley, uh, given only one example of each. So you have only this picture of eggnog, this picture of dragonfly, and so on. So it's, this is a very challenging task because uh, you don't have enough data to fine tune a whole model on it. 
uh, and there is, of course, a whole subfield with its, uh, its own uh, evaluation procedure. So to evaluate uh, a model on the few short learning task, you will take uh, a huge data set like ImageNet, and you will sample a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, few short tasks uh, like this one. Uh, typically with 1,000, and to do uh, this sampling, you will just select five, classing, five classes among all the classes uh, in ImageNet, and uh, then you will select one example of each to be uh, the support example, so the labeled data you, your model will have access to, and then uh, you will select, all, uh, again, randomly, the query sample, so this image here that you want to classify. And Doing this process, it will, uh, from academic benchmark, it will naturally create a bias towards this kind of task. So here you will um, hopefully notice that these classes don't have anything to do with one another, and that never in the history of humanity uh, did anyone had to uh, distinguish uh, an image between eggnog, dragonfly, hammerhead, vase, and valley. But this is a kind of task that we will evaluate on when we, we uh, use academic benchmarks. Uh, at CICAR, we, we observed that on industrial cases, uh, the problem was uh, more typically to distinguish between classes that were very closely uh, related. And this gap between uh, the academic benchmarks and our needs uh, in uh, industrial use cases, uh, this is very, very impactful for the trustworthiness of our methods. So please come to uh, see me at the poster on the left right here. Merci. Thank you. Alors, Ramzi, where is Ramzi? Ah, <laughs> I think we have a slide, but you are the, you have the poster. Is it fine? Sorry. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Ramzi, and I'm a research engineer at uh, ERT Systemics. So. Our work, which is a part of an academic uh, project under, under the, the direction of the philosopher uh, Stefan Canu, and with the help of um, uh, uh, Mohamed present somewhere here, consists in developing uh, a MIP, which is a mixed integer programming server adapted to the robustness problem. So just for those who are not familiar with uh, MIP optimization, it's a technique for global combinatorial optimization, usually uh, solved by um, where we, what we call branch and mode methods. So, okay, to make it simple, for from an AI model and, and an image, we will try to find the optimal adversarial attack, of course, according to distance, like, for example, the L2 norm. Uh, here, the optimality is very important because it's the point that allows us to improve the robustness. Um, so the challenge is to build a new improved solver based on branch and mode method. And if you are um, curious about the quality of the solution that we get or the ability uh, to improve the computing time compared to the state-of-the-art method, um, or how it behaves for large image and more complex model. So you are welcome around the poster, and thank you very much.
Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ahmed Berjawi, and I'm doing this presentation on behalf of Andres Troya. Thank you, Andres. Um, so this poster is about um, a method to, admit, um, to evaluate confidence metrics or confidence scores. Here's, yeah, here it is. So if you use normal logits, for example, on this um, um, diffusion, um, yeah, diffusion generated cat, as you can see, uh, the logits and the output of the softmax says it's a horse. Well, we wanted a cat. Anyway, so you see that this is not a real, uh, a very good conf uh, confidence score. So what we want to do f um, with this poster is to see what characterizes a, a nice confidence score. So what nice properties, is it a good one or not? This morning, for example, Patrick Perez talked about uh, true class probability, which is um, a confidence, an intrusive method of uh, assessing uh, uh, how uh, a, a model um, has confidence or not in what it's predicting, for example, for, uh, for supervised classification. I'm also, I also have another uh, poster about uh, attribution-based confidence score uh, where we have another score. And we want to see if these scores are good or not. So what we do is that we uh, assess them on out-of-distribution training. So uh, we assess the distribution for correctly classified examples and also the distribution for wrongly classified examples. And we compare these, as you can see here. And when the two distributions are very uh, far apart from each other, then we have a strong confidence score. And when they're a bit uh, intersected, as you can see in the middle, or in the, bad, in the worst case uh, on the left, uh, that's the worst case. So if you have more questions about this, please come visit uh, my stand. Thank you. So hi, I'm Arthur, and I'm a first year PhD student in uh, ERT Systemics and Mix Laboratory in Central Supelec. And so my topic of research is neurosymbolic AI, which is a growing field of research aiming at combining the learning capabilities of neural networks and the robustness or explainability of uh, symbolic or logical reasoners. And so in my poster, I um, shortly present and compare two uh, techniques called semantic projection, sorry for the typo, and semantic regularization. But just first quickly, uh, as you can imagine, there are many ways uh, one can try to embed or infuse uh, background knowledge into a neural network, uh, depending on the source of the knowledge, its representation, so is it mathematical equations describing the physics of your system, or is it uh, logical rules that uh, some experts came out with? And uh, the stage of the ML pipeline that you're trying to uh, boost or uh, improve with your uh, symbolic knowledge. And so to locate a little bit my work, I'm mainly using semantics uh, in the shape of uh, logical rules and uh, knowledge graphs. And I'm trying to improve uh, either the architecture of the network or the uh, learning algorithm. And so uh, the first, uh, so this is a summary of that. So you have data, you have prior knowledge, and you're trying to improve uh, some parts of this ML pipeline to get a better solution. So the first technique I want to briefly mention is semantic regression. And basically what semantic uh, uh, regression does is uh, that uh, it uh, adds to the classical uh, scores of your neural network a regularization term that basically is a probabilistic measure of how much the outputs generated by your neural network matches the semantics of your domain. And so what you want to do is penalize your networks more when the uh, outputs um, values that are not consistent with the background knowledge that you have, and penalize it less when the values are consistent with the background knowledge, even though they are not the right values as labeled in your data sets. And for the second technique, come see my poster uh, up there. Hello, everyone. 
I am Sonia from Fieldbox. Uh, it's a company that builds AI solutions and operates them for cl client, uh, clients in uh, industry. Uh, I'm very happy to be, to be here. And, uh, and this poster will be about a uh, comparative study uh, between uh, several uh, deep learning models and several interpretability models. Why is it related to industry? So if you look at the diagram on the left, uh, it's a, a, a typical use case that is described here. Uh, if you want to inspect products on a production line, you have a camera that takes pictures of each product and uh, it goes through a deep learning model to detect the defect uh, or not. Uh, and you want, uh, you want to, uh, to have a, a very a performant model, a fast model, and interpretable results. Uh, so uh, if you come to my poster, uh, I will share with you insights on how to select the, the best interpretability method and uh, which one was, uh, was the fastest among the ones uh, we have compared and uh, why it is very important to use uh, such tools when you build AI solutions for your industrial clients. Uh, I think it was very fast. Uh, I can share with you some keywords. Uh, we compared CNNs and vision transformers that were pre-trained with a self-supervised learning approach. Uh, and uh, among uh, the, the interpretability methods, uh, there is uh, attention rollout, layer relevance propagation. So I hope there are enough buzzwords to convince you to come visit me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Fatih Abdeldara, and I'm going to talk about our work, an abstraction method towards scalable uh, verification for neural networks. Uh, as you know, that neural networks are used almost everywhere, including some safety critical systems. Uh, However, they are not so robust and vulnerable to adversarial attacks. First, let's start by the definition of formal verification of neural networks. We have some constraints on the inputs, and we want to verify that the corresponding outputs satisfies also uh, the post constraints. There exist many methods for solving this problem based on LP, MIL, SATA, SMT, and others. Uh, and others. However, most of these, I can say all of these verification methods, they do not scale to verify large neural networks due to the complexity of the models. What we are proposing is an abstraction and model reduction method based on merging nodes to reduce the size of the network and then apply a verification method on the reduced mod model and then leaves the proof and the output of this ver verification the uh, process to the original model. To do so, uh, for example, if we want to merge two nodes, we have to calculate the new weights of the abstract node. I will not uh, talk about the, the formula. We can see them uh, in the poster there. What is important here, we have an upper approximation of the, the original model, which means that Whatever x in the input do domain, we have always uh, the original model, model's output is included in our abstract model. We applied this on an ACAS XU networks. It is a benchmark, and we calculate the, input, uh, the output range along with the computation time. And we have noticed really that this approach can help reduce the computation time. Uh, with regards of the abstraction nodes. For further information and details, I look forward to see you in my poster. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tarek from uh, Sikara, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, future uh, learning also. So uh, about 16 minutes ago, uh, Etienne talked about future learning. It's the process of training uh, models to learn uh, new uh, tasks from only uh, a few examples. So typically in uh, image classification, you give the model four or five examples of a new class it has never seen before and it's supposed to be able to classify that task along with others. So these few examples, we call them a uh, support set. And because there are only uh, a very few of them, uh, it's, uh, the, the model will be very sensitive to errors in that support set. So for example, here on the left of the slide, you have an example of a, a wrong item in a support set and a real world setup. So that means you have a false example among the four the model is supplied with. So it has a very high tendency to cause uh, a performance drop in the, in the model because of this error. Uh, by synthesizing this kind of uh, mislabeled items in the support set, we observe that the performance drops linearly uh, of, uh, in the, um, at inference time uh, and pretty dramatically. So um, y you can quickly um, wipe out your performance uh, in production by introducing this kind of errors. So we propose a very simple method to um, detect this kind of outliers in your support set uh, without retraining your model or without any um, sophisticated method. So basically you just take your feature vectors and uh, apply a simple outlier detection uh, on top of that um, set of features. Um, and you can, um, we show that we can, you, you can detect pretty much 80% uh, of them with about uh, one third um, false positives. So you can, at very low cost, um, keep your support sets in production clean and avoid uh, such a dramatic drop in performance uh, of your model. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, my name is Romain and uh, I'm a PhD student at CEA, uh, which means that I would ask you kindly to sign an uh, NDA before I talk about anything. <laughs> okay, uh, so the, today I want to present Casual, which is a project uh, aiming to build uh, an interpretable by design uh, image classifier. So um, in AI, we do have already architectures which are interpretable by design, such as uh, decision trees or rule trees or linear regression, for instance. But the problem is that when you're dealing with images, you're dealing with um, inputs that has no semantic value. And uh, this is a huge problem for uh, these kind of architectures. Uh, so in recent years, there's been a new type of architectures that has been uh, developed, which is called case-based reasoning. And the idea is that we want to be able to do the classification by comparing a, a new instance that we have with examples that we've encountered in the past during the training. And by justifying the decision with similarities between something that we have in a training set, for which we know the label, and uh, a new instance. The problem is that right now, the, the way it is done, um, images are um, processed through a, a deep neural network, and we are trying to mine these kind of uh, typical examples uh, inside of the latent space of a, of a deep CNN. And the problem is that sometimes we are also using information that is not relevant to the, uh, to the decision, for instance, elements from the background. So the idea of the casual project is to try to first do a semantic realignment of all the features inside of the latent space and to select only the relevant parts of the, of the object before doing the mining of the prototypes, these, uh, these examples, and also during inference in order to reduce the computation times and then the number of uh, comparison that we can do. Thank you very much. So this concludes the... It concludes in time, in time, the set of posters 
from this uh, call for poster that we had. So we now we go back to this, no, not this one. <laughs> Dans les villages. Ah, sorry. It's somewhere. It's not here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poster interne. C'est où Ils sont où Poster, poster. Ah, c'est dans poster accepté. Ah, oui, oui. Mais tu veux appeler Et c'est après. C'est après. Non, c'est pas là. Non. non. Tu l'as mis où Tu l'as changé Non. <rire> ok. I will use my machine. Non. non, non, non. non Oh, oui, ils ont disparu Non, non, non. Ah, c'est... Attends. Non, c'est pas là. Si, c'est là. Non, là, c'est pas celle-là. C'est pas celle-là. Je vais remettre ma machine rapidement. Je vais mettre ma machine. Je vais mettre ma machine. Poster interne. <laughs> ah. yeah, well, it's just a question of screen updating or something like that. So, so Michael, where is Michael? Ah. So for these ones, we mostly have the posters themselves rather than slides. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Adalbert and today I will present you my poster that is that uh, talk about worst case execution time analysis of neural networks on GPU accelerators. Indeed, today uh, more systems are both critical and autonomous and to uh, know if a system uh, meets the deadline of a critical task, we have to compute the WCT, worst case execution time, that is an upper bound, strict upper bound of the execution time of a task. Today, we are, we are able to compute this uh, upper, upper bound for CPUs, but not on GPUs, and my work is to create formal method, static analysis, to uh, compute this worst case execution time on GPU's architectures. Uh, to do that, since uh, there is no uh, low-level documentation about uh, architectural components, we have to follow uh, a specific methodology to uh, reverse engineering the GPU. Firstly, I make an hypothesis on the component, then I perform an experiment on uh, to gather results. And finally, an, uh, I analyze the results to validate or not my hypothesis. Finally, when uh, enough components has, um, have been uh, uh, reverse engineered, I, I will create static analysis and create a formal model to estimate the WCT of a a AI application like with uh, uh, neural networks on GPU. Please feel free to ask me questions at my posters. Thank you. Where is Martin Gonzalez? 
the voice of heaven. That is God. So, okay, now, now we move. Yes. So, hello everyone. My name is Martin Gonzalez from SystemX, and I will present you a novel robustification method of perturbation purification uh, with uh, diffusion probabilistic models. So, what to do when a network that we have robustified uh, for a specific task, such as image classification, finds itself in front of invalid images outside its ODD, uh, but which occurred and which we therefore need to process successfully? And what to do when we know that a specific kind of invalid images are coming up often, but we do not uh, have relevant um, uh, images to be able to retrain our net network on them? So diffusion models, which are under the hood of many new popular technologies, such as uh, DALI uh, 2 image and stable diffusions, come and give a singular uh, answer. So these uh, models are composed of a non-neural process transforming our data distribution into pure noise, and the second process, uh, which learns to reverse that first process by generating data back from noise. Now, the purification method consists on cropping diffusion models, uh, meaning partially noising and diffusion, uh, and denoising a perturbed image, in order to annihilate the desired perturbations acting as an active mask, purifying these invalid images into valid ones. These perturbations can be adversarial or those occurring much more often uh, in, a, uh, in appearance of snow, rain, changes of camera equipment, and image compression. So diffusion purification has been made possible after being reframed as uh, neural stochastic differential equations and have shown many promising results, uh, some of which are already being applied on the Confiance IE program use cases, and for which I invite you to come to see our posture. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Barbary, a PhD student from IRT Systemics. So my uh, poster topic is directly linked uh, to my uh, PhD topic, uh, which is uh, adversarial patch attacks on object detectors. So here, let's suppose that uh, an attacker uh, does not have uh, direct access to sensors, for example, sensors of an autonomous vehicle. Uh, uh, once he has... Uh, design and print his patch, he can place it, uh, for example, here on the ground, and this patch uh, can cause a wrong class detection or suppress detection, like uh, uh, in the image here. So we can ask our, uh, ourselves how to me measure the real criticality of patch attacks. So to do so, we propose to define uh, categories of evaluation criteria, uh, each of uh, these criteria helps to better uh, understand the uh, essential feature of the attack. We use those criteria in the framework, so this framework, to rank patch attacks. So more specially, uh, the three state-of-the-art patch attacks. And uh, we try to give uh, an, an answer to uh, are they really critical. So please come to my poster at the village Robustai and Monitoring. Thank you. So I'm pleased to welcome the youngest PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So I uh, will present the PhD subject. Sub <laughs> okay, I will present the PhD subject of Adrien Lecoz, who, who couldn't be here today. So my name is Stéphane Abin. I'm his uh, advisor, and uh, it also co advised with uh, Fauzi Ajet from uh, IRT. So the, the, the question we ask in this uh, uh, in this work is uh, how can we define what I call um, operational domain? By operational domain, I mean the set of data that can be uh, reliably uh, 
processed and uh, predicted for uh, typically in a classifier. So we don't speak here of, 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 of uh, operational design domain. We speak about operational domain, which is the set of data we, we, uh, from which we can predict reliably the, the, uh, using some classifier. So the, we, we asked two questions. The first one is how do you describe this operational element? How can we describe it? And how can we estimate it? And how, and how to describe it? We decided to uh, study the, the, the a way to describe it by samples and uh, what, I, what we call uh, originally uh, uh, let's, um, extremal samples, but uh, we can also translate it by uh, um, corner cases. And the second question is uh, how do we uh, uh, estimate those corner case cases? And the way we do it is by uh, using uh, uh, generative models uh, so that we can control different uh, ways of, of uh, generating data and uh, from that uh, find those corner cases. So feel free to uh, see the, the poster and ask questions if you want. Yes. Last but not least. Hello, I am Guyane. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student at IRT Systemics, and my research is about robustness and fairness in machine learning. Uh, as you know, bias in the data set can cause bias in predictions, and the goal is to understand how this bias can be handled in a way that uh, will make predictions more accurate. So, uh, my poster is a formalization of this problem, but uh, I will not bore you too much about <laughs> formal uh, definitions. And it uh, turns out there exists a certain fairness constraint called risk parity, and enforcing this fairness constraint can actually, under certain conditions, give uh, more accurate predictions. And uh, enforcing a constraint, mathematically speaking, it means uh, solving a minimization problem, in this case, with respect to the constraint. Uh, and expected applications uh, in terms of confiance can be solving a highway river classification problem. I don't know if it's clear on the screen, but it's much clearer on my poster that you can visit. <laughs> and in this case, uh, the bias in the data is a certain uh, blue veil um, blue veil that is present in the data, and uh, we will want to handle that bias. That's it. 